Big Brother, mainstream media, government cover-ups. You want answers? Well, so does he. He's Alex Jones on the GCN Radio Network. And now, live from Austin, Texas, Alex Jones. Welcome to the Alex Jones Show on this Friday, June 26th, 2015. This has been quite a week. We've seen a lot of uh, things happen this week. We've seen the Trans-Pacific Partnership rammed through. Actually, I keep correcting myself. It's a fast track has been run through. And we need to remember that we don't say we've been talking so long about how fast track is going to be uh, the implementation of these treaties. And that's, of course, why they passed it, to make it virtually impossible to stop them. But it is not impossible to stop them. And it is not impossible to undo things that have been done wrong. Our government has been taken over by corporations. It has been taken over by globalists who are trying to create a global world order. Part of that is changing the culture. And we've seen a lot of that this week, haven't we? We've seen a witch hunt uh, with the Confederate flag. And now today we've got the Supreme Court decision extending same-sex marriage nationwide. I want to talk about that in the next segment when we've got more time. I want to talk about the legal issues behind this, because it is not a cut-and-dried situation. One of the stories that's up today is the IRS deleted backups of 24,000 Lois Lerner emails months after a subpoena. Well, you know, that's interesting, but we have seen the Supreme Court. We have seen the Department of Justice. We've seen government at every level for many, many years deleting everything in the Constitution, everything in our legal tradition, all of our due process, just making this stuff up as they go along. And, of course, that was one of the articles that we have up today. Obamacare travesty, the Supreme Court continues to make stuff up out of thin air. That was the travesty from the Supreme Court yesterday, just making stuff up about Obamacare. We're going to talk about that and the bill from a Texas congressman, Brian Babin, who is uh, proposing that the Supreme Court be forced to enroll their staff in Obamacare if they're going to keep promoting it. And, of course, uh, Justice Scalia called it SCOTUS Care, Supreme Court of the U.S. Care. If they're going to do that, maybe they ought to own it. We're going to talk about the exemptions that Congress has given themselves, of course, about Obamacare. Remember, they said we're going to have to pass it so we can find out what's in it. When they found out they were in it, they exempted themselves in some very unusual legal maneuverings. We're also going to have on this show today, we're going to have uh, Barbara Low Fisher. She's president of the National Vaccine Information Center. We're going to talk to her about the situation in California and, of course, the situation nationally, because they're trying to hold a gun to our head and force us to take vaccines. Let me read this statement to you from Barbara Low Fisher. She said, if the state can tag, track down, and force citizens against their will to be injected with biologicals of known and unknown toxicity today, there will be no limit on which individual freedoms the state can take away in the name of the greater good tomorrow. And we see that on a daily basis, don't we? We see secret laws, secret trade treaties. We see Congress abdicating its power, turning it over to a transnational committee that is going to write rules that are not just going to regulate trade. It's going to regulate the Internet. It may even regulate arms, because that's been the tact that the uh, Obama administration has been taking from the very beginning. They've gone after two things. They've gone after ammunition and they have gone after the flow of arms across borders. Because if you're going to control the flow of arms across borders, that means that you have to totally control them within the borders. If they're not tagged and tracked, just like us, because ultimately gun control is people control. But if your guns are not tagged and tracked, then They could easily flow over the border. So that's been their tack for a very long time. That's where they're coming from. We're going to talk about the uh, situation in Tunisia as well. Uh, This is a overflow of what happened in Libya. And I think beyond just getting scared about the violence and about this organization, ISIS, that our government continues to fund, equip, and send monthly paychecks to. We're going to talk to Paul Joseph Watson about that at the bottom of the hour. Besides all of that, we need to understand how Libya got into a state of chaos. And also joining us today is going to be Mark Dice. We're going to talk about several of his videos. It should be very entertaining. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Alex Jones is going to be joining us in just a couple of minutes. I'm sure he wants to weigh in on this decision by the Supreme Court. This has been an amazing week this week. You know, in the disguise of tolerance, 
We've seen history flush down the memory hole like something out of 1984. And then the next day, we see that they're going to coerce us into celebrating practices that many people feel violate their religious beliefs. But that's the essence of this. That's the essence of political correctness is the intolerance of people in the name of tolerance. But there's also a legal side of this. Now, what happened today? Well, Alex is joining us right now. Let's let Alex talk about his take on this. Go ahead, Alex. Absolutely, David. I'm going to be filing reports from Detroit here today. Uh, I'm up here uh, for a wedding. You'll be doing a great job on Sunday. But I will be filing reports, uh, not just from Detroit, but from the uh, western side of Michigan later today, where the wedding's actually happening tomorrow. But I flew into Detroit. Just letting folks know why I'm up here, but I'm going to segue off and do some reports uh, on the design, NAFTA, GAT, NAU, decimation of our industrial sectors, uh, something a foreign military power couldn't do via these internal tariffs that our NAFTA and GATT designed to transfer our industrial capacity to China, India, and Mexico, part of the global estate trilateral plan. But absolutely, you're spot on when I was calling in about, uh, and it's the two Supreme Court rulings the last two days. Obamacare is totally unconstitutional on its face. Uh, it is completely discriminatory, uh, totally fraudulent, meant to enrich the insurance companies. And they're going to continue over and over again to uh, uphold it because it's what the establishment wants. And it's the same thing with the whole gay marriage situation. Let's just get past all that, depoliticize it. It's a state issue. There's no way the federal government could rule on something like that nationwide. So th this is all part of the imperial federal government. But forget the imperial federal government. It now is a legate or a viceroy to the globalists, which are offshore with the TPP and the rest of it. So here's the main point to take away from all of this. The globalists have dropped the hammer, not just here, but across the globe. They're accelerating their programs. They're engaging in divide and conquer manipulations scientifically deployed, uh, but if people just wake up to the overall manipulation, basically it will uh, only uh, make people uh, resist what's happening. But you've got to get them out of the trance. You've got to get them out of the mind. That's why the population split into two groups, really. People that are awake and know what's going on and people that are in a trance and buy as, as mother's milk uh, everything the government and major corporations say. Uh, this is just an unprecedented time to be alive, and it's a very important time, obviously, uh, to be alive because history is being set right now. And folks need to understand, the globalist program is behind schedule about 10 years, most experts agree, about 10 to 15 years, depending on which program. And their program is in trouble everywhere systemically, and so they're accelerating the program, which – they may win the race, but they're going to lose the overall uh, season of races here because they're going to blow their engine. Uh, they are going all out right now with their afterburners. Uh, and if, if, if we just develop a culture of freedom, a culture that's based on sovereignty, a culture that's based on basic human freedom and private property, and what's in our Bill of Rights, uh, that will be the culture that will basically supplant this failed fallen culture. That's why it's so totalitarian. That's so autocratic is because it, it, it has to be. And that's why it obsesses on discrimination and people being wrong. So people can be obsessed with false things they're being wronged about and not the overall total enslavement at a technocratic, technotronic level. But I'm going to throw it back to you, David Knight. A great job, crew. Great job, listeners. Uh, people are waking up across the world. We need to realize how legendary and how serious this fight is and how important a place in human development we all have. This is an epic, historical battle. I am so honored. Is this the exit right here? Sorry, I'm driving on the highway to this other uh, deindustrialized area. And it just comes down to that. We have to understand our place in history. Yes, things are bad. Yes, it's demoralizing. Yes, we get sad sometimes. But by resisting it, our spirits become stronger. This is the animating contest of liberty. And they want to erase the American culture because it's not perfect. But compared to every other culture, it was dynamic. It was special. It was the flower, as I've said a thousand times, of the Renaissance. Thomas Jefferson was probably the greatest expression of the Renaissance. 
uh, Washington refusing to be king uh, was the greatest expression of a true warrior poet. I mean, we've reached uh, just an amazing time where the enemy want to pull these people down because it is coffin nails to them and their entire agenda. So I'm going to hand it back to you, David Knight, and to all the powerful guests, Paul Watson coming up, uh, and everyone else today. But I salute our reporters. I salute everyone involved in the fight against the globalists. That's why I never want to be thanked. It is totally humbling to be associated with all of you, the incredible crew, the people behind the scenes. Uh, world government's now out in the open. The Pope's called for it. World tyranny is now here. The battle lines are drawn. Choose which side you're on, folks. That's what it comes down to. This is the rise of the AI state that will follow the orders of the technotronic rulers. This is an incredible time to be alive. Yes, it's frightening, it's, but, but it's, it's animating. I mean, history's always been frightening. It's always been full of beauty and also evil and corruption, but also honor. And so this is what separates the boys from the men. This is it. God bless you all. Infowars.com is the front lines of the fight. Thank you, Alex. That's Alex Jones on the road. I'm David Knight in studio. We have a packed show today. We're going to have Paul Joseph Watson joining us at the bottom of the hour to talk about the this beheading and explosion uh, in Tunisia. We also have Barbara Lowe Fisher going to be joining us. Uh, she's going to be talking about the situation about mandatory vaccines. Of course, we have mandatory everything anymore don't we yesterday was mandatory uh health care day i guess so we saw it was it was portrayed as subsidies but you have to ask yourself who's being subsidized here yes there are there's insurance that's being given to some people but the major subsidy is not to the individuals the major subsidy is to the big insurance corporations they're the ones who are defining what you have to buy in many cases it's far more than you need far more than you can use there's cases of them requiring single men to have pregnancy coverage, that type of thing. So you're not allowed to choose what level of insurance to buy. They tell you, and then they set the price, and then they get a subsidy for that insurance from the government. So don't tell me that they're subsidizing individuals. They are subsidizing big insurance. That's what this has been about from the very beginning. But what we saw in the decision yesterday and what we see in the Supreme Court decision today is an absolute just rejection of the rule of law, a rejection of the written word. And we're going to talk about that. First, I want to give you an idea of uh, who's on the show today. As I said, uh, Barbara Lowe Fisher, co-founder of the National Vaccine Information Center. She's going to be joining us later in the show, as well as Mark Dice. And uh, before I get into the Supreme Court thing, I want to let you know that this hour, the Alex Jones Show, is made possible by the high-quality products that we sell at InfoWarsLife.com, and of course, products like Survival Shield X2, nascent iodine. We've got over 400 reviews on InfoWarsLife.com. Uh, this product alone, over 99% of the respondents would recommend it to friend or family members. We've been blown away by this response. I want to read you a couple of these uh, reviews. We've been reading these a couple of uh, for a couple of days. This one's from uh, Trixie in Akron, Ohio. She says, "I rarely write product reviews." But I had to give my opinion on X2 after just two and a half weeks. I've already lost weight, lost the brain fog I've had for years, and have increased energy. I've suffered from an underactive thyroid for years, was searching for a natural iodine supplement that actually worked. X2 is it. I've already started recommending this product to my family and friends. Then another from Laura in Wisconsin. She says, love using the iodine. I can always tell the days I go without it, but it helps me focus and I feel I'm more aware. You know, I think it's always important to get, uh, I, I like liquid supplements like uh, we sell with this because they're so effective. You know, when you put something uh, in liquid form, you take it sublingually, you, you swallow it, you don't have to worry if this thing is going to dissolve and, um, and dissipate throughout your system. I think it's very effective to do that. That's why I like to get the products. Most of the products that we sell are in liquid form, of course, you know, you can get uh, supplements that are high quality that are not in liquid form. Some things don't lend themselves to that. But that's the kind of quality that we try to put in the products at InfoWarsLife.com. And, of course, you can get that right now. You can read the reviews at InfoWarsLife.com. Now, getting back to this Supreme Court situation. Again, yesterday, we were amazed at what the Supreme Court had said about Obamacare. It was talking about state subsidies. And... The rationale that they were putting out there was, well, you know, we don't really want to go through the uh, legislative process to have them redefine the law. So let's just redefine it. Let's just rewrite it. And Scalia said, you're just making this up. 
a Supreme Court justice said that of his colleagues. You know, we're just rewriting this. The words don't mean anything. I talked yesterday to Michael Snyder, and uh, we were just amazed at that. Of course, he has a legal background. He writes for us a lot at uh, Infowars.com. We have a article up today talking about that, uh, talking about the conversation we had. He says, Obamacare travesty, the Supreme Court continues to make stuff up out of thin air. Well, of course, that was yesterday. Today, we have another thing that they have made up out of thin air. I think it's interesting, though, before we move to the marriage decision, to see the reaction from a uh, Texas Republican, Sen uh, Representative Brian Babin from Texas. House Republican on Thursday proposed forcing the Supreme Court justices and their staff to enroll in Obamacare. And what he said was that um, he said, as the Supreme Court continues to ignore the letter of the law, it's important that these six individuals fully understand the impact of their decisions on the American people. That's why I introduced the SCOTUS Care Act to require the Supreme Court and all of its employees to sign up for Obamacare. Congress has had them found themselves in Obamacare when they passed it and found out what was in it. They didn't like being in there, so they gave themselves an exemption. But then it got even stranger, and I'm going to tell you about that when we come back. We're going to be joined in the next segment by Paul Joseph Watson from the U.K. We're going to talk about uh, the events of today in Tunisia and uh, Paul's article, the background to it. Uh, jihadists attack a French gas factory, behead a victim there. So we're going to talk to Paul about that in the next segment. This segment, I want to talk about the Supreme Court decision today. Yesterday, we had an insane decision about Obamacare where they really couldn't care less about what the law says. I think this one is along the same lines doing what they wish without regard to the law. And I'm not the only one saying that, of course. It was Scalia saying that yesterday about their decision for Obamacare. Today, we had a 5-4 decision. Justice Anthony Kennedy joined the court's four more liberal justices to say that essentially marriage is a right and that they have the authority to define marriage in Washington. I don't see that in the Constitution. We're going to talk about their their decision. First of all, here, here's some of their argumentation. They say the history of marriage as a union between two persons of the opposite sex marks the beginnings of these cases. And when I started reading this, I thought, well, you know, maybe that's part of the problem. I mean, the first problem is we look at rights, our original view of rights, the view of rights that we saw in the Declaration of Independence, the view of rights that we saw in the Constitution, was an idea that it was something that we all possessed as individuals. It was something that we inherited from God. We were given that from God. And the primary thrust was we had to stop government from taking those rights, from uh, infringing on those rights. And so that was what the Bill of Rights was about. It was about government, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this other thing. And one of the things that they summed it up with, of course, in the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, they said, if we haven't explicitly given you these powers, you cannot imply them. But, of course, everything the government does today is implied power, not expressly given to them. They go on to talk about how this is a changed understanding of marriage and it's characteristic of a nation where new dimensions of freedom are becoming apparent to new generations. Well, going back to that first uh, statement where they talk about the purpose of marriage uh, and looking at it between same sex or opposite sex, throughout history, marriage's purpose was to... Procreate, to have children, to have a family. That's why even in ancient Greece, where homosexuality was very prevalent, very common, they did not have homosexual marriage. Marriage was for family. That, among other things, of course, uh, Christians also understand it from a religious per uh, perspective. That is one of the reasons why it has been between opposite sex members. This is something that's come on us very quickly. You know, it was in the, um, at, at one point I went back and I looked at, a large dictionary that I have. A uh, it, it's it's from the 1950s, and for those of you who are on radio, I would say it's at least eight inches tall. It's got over 600,000 words in it, and I wanted to see how they defined marriage. I wanted to see how they defined uh, you know gay and homosexual. I knew that gay had been something that had been brought in in the 1970s. You know, the word homosexual was not even a part of the giant unabridged Webster Dictionary in the 1950s, they quickly brought that in as a neutral. Then they changed it to a positive. And the problem that I have with this from a perspective of a lot of Christians 
is not what people are doing. I frankly don't care if you go and get married on the summer solstice in front of Stonehenge. That's your business. I don't care who you live with. That's your business. But when you force me to celebrate what you're doing and use the coercive power of government, you've crossed the line. You've crossed the line on so many different ways. Now, this is what they're saying in the Supreme Court. They say the 14th Amendment requires a state to license a marriage between two people of the same sex. So I looked at the 14th Amendment because I couldn't remember that being in the 14th Amendment. I didn't remember even there being anything about marriage. You know, the 14th Amendment was done in 1866 to 1868. It finally got ratified by the last state in 1868 when it went into effect. It, along with the 13th Amendment, were really responses to what had happened in the Civil War. It was the 13th Amendment, if you remember, in 1865 that freed the slaves, along the lines of the discussion we had yesterday. It wasn't Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. That didn't free any slaves. People who had slaves that were in states that were under federal control were explicitly excluded from Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. So you had a lot of people who had slaves in those states, like Missouri, like Ulysses S. Grant, who kept his slaves until they were made illegal, until that practice was made illegal in 1865, so that the slaves were freed by the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment came along and said, we're going to give them citizenship. And here's what it says. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Wait a minute. What's this about denying people due process and property? How, do, how does that uh, fit into civil asset forfeiture? They conveniently ignore the parts of the Constitution they don't want to pay attention to, and they invent other parts. We'll be right back with Paul We're Joseph. We're on Watson. the march. We're going to be going to Paul Joseph Watson in the UK to talk about these multiple jihadist attacks. We've had an attack in Tunisia on a hotel. We've also had an attack on a, uh, a gas factory in France. Um, I guess it's the, at that time of year there's a celebration going on, and I guess that's the way some of these people interpret their religion uh, to uh, kill people over the Ramadan holiday. Uh, I know there's a lot of people who don't interpret it that way, but there certainly appears to be uh, people who are on the warpath these couple of days. Before I go to Paul, I want to let you know that this segment of the Alex Jones Show is made possible by our Made in 1776 clothing line. If you're tired of getting stuff at the big box retailers, that's made by slave labor in China and elsewhere. Everything in the made in 1776 line is made right here in America. For a limited time, you can get 25% off our best-selling Molan Lave belt buckles. And uh, this is something I think that if you look, I've got one of them on. I'm not going to stand up and show it to you. But these are great belt buckles. It's a great way to engage people in a conversation. They look good. They send a message. And it's always, uh, you know, it could sometimes be awkward to talk about important issues when everybody's just talking about trivial nonsense. If you uh, wear some Made in 1776 clothing, that can open the door to that kind of discussion. So we have the uh, belt buckles again. They're 25% off right now. You can find them along with the Save America t-shirt, the uh, Molon Lave hoodie, and many other things at the InfoWarsStore.com. Just click on Made in 1776. It's on the left-hand side. All right, so joining us right now is Paul Joseph Watson from the UK. Paul, thank you for coming on. Hi, David. Good to be back. It's uh, quite a day today. We've got a lot of things on the menu. We've talked about the Supreme Court decision here uh, saying that they have the right to define marriage for everyone in the country. But then we've got um, these Islamic attacks where they're uh, literally on the warpath. Some of them, uh, uh, some have called for this to happen during the Ramadan holiday. Tell us about it. Well, there's been three attacks, obviously, one in Lyon in France, where two individuals basically drove into a gas company, a U.S.-owned gas company, beheaded somebody, basically stuck his decapitated head on a pole, scrawled it with Islamic writing. Then we've got a situation in Tunisia where they massacred a bunch of people on a beach, upwards of 27, 28 people dead. We've also got an attack on a mosque, a Shiite mosque in Kuwait. Um, last count was at least 11 dead. So three major attacks. You've also got Islamic State militants in the Syrian border town of Kobani um, going door to door, massacring at least 120 people, maybe more. So it's mm. a day of bloodshed. Wow, that's amazing. And one of the articles that we've got up on Infowars.com right now, uh, Kurt Nemo had 
a uh, quote uh, from Hamid al Adnani urging, quote, calamity for the infidels in an audio message, and he tied it to Ramadan. Your comments? Yeah, basically what we've got is this constant debate which goes on after these kind of attacks between left and right, where the left routinely say, this has nothing to do with Islam as a violent ideology. It's all related to U.S. foreign policy. Then we have people on the right saying, no, it's got nothing to do with U.S. foreign policy. It's all about, it's all about Islam being a violent ideology. When it's clearly both, and mm-hmm. we can take it from both perspectives, but they don't ever entertain the fact that it could, both of those factors could be tr- contributing to these attacks. So Cameron came out almost immediately after this attack in France and said, Islam is a religion of peace. We hear this over and over again when clearly... And as he said, the vast majority of Muslims are peaceful people. They're never going to attack anybody. But Islam is not a religion of peace. That's why it's the source, foundation and inspiration for groups like ISIS, because the Quran contains over 100 verses that directly or indirectly call on Muslims to murder or go to war with non-believers. That's the source of the bloodshed. That's not a religion of peace. And then we ask the question, You know, how many Muslims actually support ISIS? Is it a tiny, tiny minority that support this extremism, as we're constantly told? Again, no, that's not the case. You look at France, where today's beheading took place. They had a poll last year in August, which found that one-sixth of French citizens had a, quote, favorable view of ISIS. And then a staggering Hmm. 27% of people aged between 18 and 24 In France, French citizens sympathize with ISIS. They had another poll, Al Jazeera television channel, Al Jazeera Arabic. 81% support what ISIS is doing in Iraq and Syria. So to argue that this isn't a disturbing percentage of Muslims who support ISIS is completely naive. It's clear that a significant minority of Muslims throughout the world do support ISIS. But again and again, after these attacks, we have, you know, people on the left, the leftist media saying that you can't blame all Muslims uh, for these kind of attacks, which is true. But then on the flip side, as we saw with Salon.com, they collectively impugn all white people for the actions of one lunatic in Charleston. So you can't have it both ways. But in this politically correct environment, They refuse to even entertain the fact, which is a fact, it's provable, um, that Islam is at its root a violent religion. And that's where the terrorists who carried out these tragic attacks today uh, draw their belief system from. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They they can't have it both ways, uh, Paul, because we live in this kind of Kafkaesque world where anything goes, whatever they say is is true. Now, of course, you, you pointed out that there's a lot of broad based support based on polls of uh, people in France and elsewhere supporting ISIS. We also know that the Pentagon is supporting ISIS as well. We have an article that came out yesterday from Mikhail Phelan, Pentagon playing ISIS, paying ISIS-linked rebels $400 a month to eventually fight Assad. They've actually got ISIS on welfare after having created them and trained them and equipped them to go after Syria. They've now got them on welfare. <laughs> well, I mean... And even Western countries, Sweden, for example, some prominent politicians and councillors in Sweden are actively calling for ISIS militants who return from the battlefield from places like Syria and Iraq to be given jobs and government welfare when they return to (laughs) Sweden. So it's not just, you know, the, the U.S. that's providing that. But again, oh, so they can have welfare while they're there waiting and then they have, you know, forward deployment and then they come back uh, well, to the West and they can get they can get on welfare special treatment as well. This, <laughs> this, is, this is the point. When Islamic extremists, people in France, like today, for example, terrorists, when they kill people in Syria, we call them moderate rebels and send them weapons and money. So it's a complete disconnect. Mm-hmm. And again, you have people on the right saying, this has got nothing to do with U.S. foreign policy or NATO foreign policy. Well, clearly it has. Number one, Saudi Arabia is the biggest exporter of extremist ideology and terrorists 
in the world. All the radical preachers that come over to the UK, to Western Europe, to the United States, um, a significant portion of them anyway, they were trained in Saudi Arabia in this extremist Wahhabi ideology. They're trained, they're protected, they're even given awards by the Saudi royal family. They then travel across to Britain, to America, to other Western European countries to spread this violent, hateful ideology. And yet we're still allies with Saudi Arabia, of course, which is the driving force behind this Sunni extremism. They armed, they protected, they coddled ISIS in the first place. Then we've obviously got the fact that our governments in Libya, in Syria, directly armed and funded and continue to do so. These very same jihadists, many of whom went on to join ISIS in the name of toppling Gaddafi and Assad. So that's the key point to make. It's both factors. It's both the fact that Islam is at its core a violent ideology, and it's the fact that our support for these jihadists through our foreign policy uh, leads to this further radicalization. Even in Libya, after the fall of Gaddafi, the guy now leading ISIS in Libya, uh, Bel Hajj, he was the, the head of the Libyan fighting forces in Libya to overthrow Gaddafi that the US and NATO supported. Now he's leading ISIS. Of course, Libya is now a total hellhole. Um, thousands of people who live there are desperately trying to escape on boats and come to Italy and Great Britain and other places in Europe. ISIS has said they will infiltrate Western Europe through these migrant boats, through infiltrating them that way. So it's a complete disaster, and our foreign policy has in part led to it. And, of course, uh, what we saw in these hotels, these uh, shootings in the hotels uh, in Tunisia, uh, back in September of last year, the New York Times pointed out that since the revolution that had happened back in 2011, overthrowing Gaddafi, and, of course, that was the United States government's plan, they've had 1.8 million Libyans flow into Tunisia. And so the kind of violence that we saw at these hotels, as you're pointing out, they're also now we've got a smaller number of people because Tunisia is just right next door to Libya. They can just go across the border. It's a little bit harder for them to travel across the Mediterranean to uh, Italy and elsewhere to Greece. But they are going to come. That's where they're going to come. And with them, they're going to bring this violence that we have created. So when we look at this, like you're talking about, Paul, it's like, the aspect of the the violence within uh, much of Islam, as well as our, our government's involvement. When we look at our government's involvement, there's two components to that as well. It's not just a blowback of bad policy, like a lot of people have talked about. It's not just the uh, results of overthrowing Qaddafi, of the uh, arming of rebels that we saw going on in Benghazi and what that was all fundamentally about. But it's also a deliberate plan to create instability by our government. That's what a lot of people will not acknowledge. We can see that in Europe and the Ukraine, and we can certainly see that in Libya and northern Africa, and now with this violence that is going to be immigrating into Europe. Precisely. And you can see that in the news now almost every day. There are these immigrant camps in Calais, which is a northern French port town, where thousands of people, a lot of them, most of them North Africans, many from Libya, are encamped in Calais, they literally try to hijack ship um, trucks, sorry, transport vehicles that are going into Britain. I they remember that video, that, that article that you put up. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that video, video was amazing. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Basically terrifying the, the drivers, you know, tourists on buses going into England. Again, as a, partly as a result of our foreign policy that's driven them out of Libya in desperation because that is a hellhole now run by uh, warlords. So they're desperately trying to illegally immigrate into Britain, and that's causing a separate crisis on top of this terrorism. Then there's another point, which I don't know if you've got. And the that's a video we've got right now that is showing what yeah. happened in uh, Calais, France, as they were trying to get across yeah. the channel to uh, the UK. Just absolute chaos, uh, jumping on trucks, hijacking trucks, just amazing. Absolute bedlam, and in fact, the the truckers are going on strike. They're going to find it difficult to import many foods into the United Kingdom. They're talking about even a collapse of the food supply, at the very least soaring prices, because they're having to go a huge way around. They're having to go into Holland instead before they reach Britain, and it's, it's far more expensive. So you've got that crisis. 
And if they try to do anything about that, Paul, they're accused of being xenophobic or racist. They can't control the borders. They can't control immigration. And that's all part of the larger plan of the globalists to try to take down the Western countries, the wealthier countries, by this kind of cloward and Piven explosion, bringing in as many people as quickly as they can, expanding the welfare roles. That's been a long-term plan, but now they are accelerating that to the point of collapse. Then they can rebuild their socialist, utopian world government on the uh, ruins of what they take down. Precisely, and then in relation to that cloud and Piven strategy, you know, remember what Obama said after Charleston. You might be able to pull up the clip. He said, after, the, of course, the mass shooting which killed nine people, Dylan Roof, of course, the culprit, he said, quote, this type of mass violence does not happen in other advanced countries. <laughs> well, yes, it clearly does. It's happened in France twice in the last six months alone. It happened in Denmark shortly after the Charlie Hebdo massacre. But the difference, obviously, between Garland, which was an ISIS-inspired attack, and today's attack near Lyon, is the fact that the only victims in Garland were the terrorists who launched the attack. Yes. There were no innocent yes. victims in Garland. And why is that? Well, it's because, obviously, responsible people in Garland had firearms and were able to use them, which, ironically, is the very thing that the left wants to abolish and eviscerate in the wake of Charleston. I hey. dare to venture that if somebody at the front gate of this gas company that was attacked today had firearms like they had in Garland, then the poor individual who was decapitated might still be still be alive today. But Absolutely. that's the difference. You know, in, in the wake of that Charleston shooting, I interviewed a man from South Africa, Charles Van Veek. And uh, it was about uh, 23 years ago that there was a similar attack on a church, except it was much more virulent. There were a lot more people there. This uh, attack in Charleston was a small prayer meeting group, and the individual killed pretty much everybody that was there. But in this attack in uh, South Africa, there were over a 1,000 people. Some accounts put it at 1,300 people. And they, their intention was to kill every single person in that church they came in spraying AK-47s, four gunmen, and threw two grenades. And so in a very short time, they were able to kill, I think it was 11 people, a couple of more people than were killed in the Charleston shooting. They seriously uh, injured 58 people. But there was one individual, it was a very, very large church, and he was all the way in the back, uh, catty corner to that, Paul, and he had a snub nose 38, which is not designed for shooting at a distance. And he only had five shots. He got off two shots uh, and he wounded one of them. He didn't know that. He came around the backside. Uh, they had stepped back because they realized at that point somebody was shooting. They didn't expect anybody to be uh, carrying any firearms because it was a liberal white church in a white neighborhood. When he came around behind them and saw them looking at the door that they had come out thinking that uh, there were going to be gunmen charging out there, they were going to shoot them when they came out, he came around behind them and shot. At that point, they fled. He saved the lives of over a 1,000 people with just that snub nose, 38 and five shots. And so we know that's very effective. We've seen that in the uh, in the uh, shootings. Uh, what was the uh, was it in Kenya? I think we had the two different shootings. One of them that went on for a very long time. Another one that was stopped relatively early with someone who was uh, in the area that had a, uh, a concealed weapon. So we know that it's very effective at shutting those down. People can always kill individuals at the very beginning with a kind of sucker punch, but you can stop the attack before it goes on for days before you have hundreds or thousands of people killed. Yeah, and then you compare that to Charlie Hebdo. Not only mm -hmm. were the cartoonists who were attacked unarmed, but the police, when they first arrived on the scene, were unarmed and had to basically scurry away <laughs> before they could send in the anti-terror squad. So again, unarmed people become victims far more easy, and that was proven again in the, in the Garland attack. We've got to go to break, and we're going to be right back with Paul Joseph Watson from the UK. An amazing day of violence. What's behind it? We'll be right back. Again, going over the Happenings today, the violence, the Islamic violence that's happening um, throughout uh, the Middle East and Europe. We've got ISIS going city to uh, door to door in the city of uh, Hasaka, I think is maybe the way you pronounce that. Nevertheless, they're going door to door killing people. We had a beheading at a French uh, gas company uh, and as well as an explosion. And then we had a lot of people shot at uh, multiple hotels in Tunisia. And of course, Tunisia has been flooded 
with nearly 2 million refugees. Of course, it was 1.8 million, according to the New York Times last September, refugees from Libya. The reason? Because of Colonel Gaddafi's deposition there by the American uh, forces. And we have turned that place into a recruitment base for ISIS terrorism. This article we had yesterday, uh, the Pentagon announced on Monday that it's begun paying moderate Syrian rebels up to $400 per month. Now, these are the people that uh, John McCain meets with, you know. Uh, they're supposed to be uh, moderate. They called it uh, critical. That was what the Secretary of Defense, Ashton Carter, says. He said he's going to equip as many as 5,400 fighters within the next 12 months, according to USA Today. So we're going to be paying up to 5,400 fighters, $400 a month just to hang around. So at one point, they can go in and take down the Syrian government because that's what the American policy is. It's one of destabilization. It's actually a globalist policy. And I think we've got uh, Paul back with us. Uh, Paul, your comments. No, we don't have Paul, I guess. Uh, this uh, Islamic cleric who put out a Ramadan uh Statement uh, says, if you kill a disbelieving yeah. American or European, especially the spiteful and filthy French, he says, or Australian or Canadian or any other disbelievers. And he goes on to suggest how you might do this in case you're not sure how to kill people, according to his uh, prescription. He says, smash his head with a rock or slaughter him with a knife or run him over with your car or throw him down from a high place or choke him or poison him, said Al Adnani in a speech released uh, well, okay, uh, just be careful because uh, Texans shoot back. We saw that happen, and uh, it will be happening. That's why we carry firearms. Let's play that clip from Obama saying that this kind of violence uh, doesn't happen in other countries. Go ahead. But let's be clear. At some point, we as a country will have to reckon with the fact that this type of mass violence does not happen in other advanced countries. It doesn't happen in other places with this kind of frequency. And it is in our power to do something about it. I say that recognizing the politics in this town uh, foreclose a lot of those avenues right now. Yeah, you know, it is in our power to do something about that. And we don't have the same kind of shootings in this country that you have in other countries because... We do have the power and the ability and the means to defend ourselves. Of course, Obama doesn't like it. The Pope doesn't like it. I mean, I haven't seen any pronouncements from the Pope about uh, the Supreme Court decision on homosexual marriage. But he was telling us earlier in the week that it was sometimes a moral imperative to uh, get divorced. I imagine that there's a lot of conservative Catholics whose heads are spinning over a Pope that is... <laughs> essentially flipped the Catholic Church's position upside down, just like our government has flipped the law upside down. Of course, he seems to be much more interested in uh, leading from a political situation than he is from leading from a moral situation. We have him saying that even having guns is anti-Christian. No, it's the way that you defend each other. Just as I pointed out when I talked to the uh, fellow from South Africa, his book was entitled The Right and Duty of Self-Defense. That was a subtitle of his book. The title was Shooting Back. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight here in Austin. We've been talking to Paul Joseph Watson in the U.K., we lost contact with Paul. I wanted to give him the uh, final word on what's going on in uh, Europe as well as in Tunisia with these multiple instances of violence uh, in France, Tunisia, Syria, people going door to door, killing people in Syrian towns. Uh, Paul, your last words on this. Yeah, just one final thing. We've had a debate for the entire week in the aftermath of the Charleston shooting about the Confederate flag. So I asked the question on Twitter earlier, you know, why didn't we just ban the ISIS flag? Surely that would prevent extremists <laughs> from murdering people, right? That's you know, perfect. surely if we'd have just banned the ISIS flag, this beheading in France would have never have happened, which, of course, is completely ridiculous. But that's the argument we've been fed all this week in the aftermath of the Dylan roof shootings to the point now where Amazon.com is talking about forcing book publishers, which will put many books out of print permanently, to change the covers which display the Confederate flag. So oh, yeah. we're, we're talking about 
historical books about the Civil War being forced to change the front covers in order to continue to be sold on Amazon. It's completely ludicrous. Apple came out yesterday and said they were banning, and in fact they did go ahead and ban, all games in the App Store which had a Civil War context. So I guess now, you know, if a neo-Nazi goes and shoots 10 people dead, they're going to have to ban all World War II video games. They're going to have to remove um, William Shira's The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich from Amazon.com because it's got a swastika on the front cover. That's you know, the Paul, height of ridiculousness that we've seen this week. I, I think that's a good point. Why don't we just ban the uh, ISIS flag and then we can stop all this stuff? You know, we didn't even really have to fight World War II. We could have just banned the Nazi flag. That would have uh, done it. Uh, I, I think it's interesting when you look at Amazon. Of course, they have an, a history of censorship. Uh, you can buy books, uh, store them electronically on your Kindle device or other things like your iPhone, iPad. And they deleted 1984 from a lot of people's devices as a, as a famous occurrence. Uh, a stroke of irony there. They just took the entire novel and flushed it down the memory hole. That's what's going to happen with these books when they say we can no longer bear to look at the Confederate flag symbol. Yeah, and, you know, people say, well, they're a private company. They can do what they like. Mm -hmm. That's correct. But then what if you have another mass shooting and every single Walmart store in America stops selling guns? What if other gun stores say, oh, we're not going to sell, you know, uh, semi-auto rifles because of this, and they restrict it further and fur further and further, which is why, you know, people need to boycott this if they disagree with it. Yes, it's their right as a private enterprise to sell what they like, but it's also our right to call them out on it and boycott them when it gets to that level where they're actually talking about banning Civil War books because there might be a Confederate flag on the cover. You know, Warner Brothers has banned the, the Dukes of Hazard car because mm -hmm. that has a Confederate mm -hmm. flag on the on the roof. It's, it's completely insane. Well, I'll tell you what I find offensive. I mean, certainly slavery is offensive, but I also find the profound ignorance uh, offensive. Jim Webb, who was a senator from Virginia, he was a Democrat senator from Virginia. He was also appointed as uh, a Navy secretary by Ronald Reagan. There's talk that he might run for president, but he hasn't evidently uh, sold out to a big money interest yet. But he said we should remember that honorable Americans fought on both sides of the Civil War, including slave home holders in the Union Army. You know, people like U.S. Grant. Uh, many sla non-slave holders fought for the South, he says. In recognition of the character of soldiers on both sides, the federal government authorized the construction of the Confederate Memorial 100 years ago on the grounds of Arlington National Cemetery. We don't realize that our entire country is illegitimate if we don't support the right of secession. So is the Declaration of Independence coming up in just a few days. Thank you so much for joining us. Paul Joseph Watson, stay with us. Right after the break, we're going to be talking to Barbara Lowe Fisher about what's going on with vaccine mandates in California and across the country and the issues associated with your right of consent. We're going to be talking to Barbara Lowe Fisher, president of the National Vaccine Information Center. We're going to get an update from her on what's going on with the mandatory vaccination bill, SB 277 in California. We're going to talk to her about other laws across the country. And of course, the broader issues of civil liberties, legal issues, medical ethics, the legal immunity for these corporations that are working with the government to vaccinate us. And of course, the medical issues about vaccines themselves. We're going to talk to her about all of that. She's with us this next hour. Before we do, this hour of Alex Jones is made possible by your support of ultra high quality products that you'll find at InfoWarsLife.com. Products like our Survival Shield X2 nascent iodine. You know, for me, X2 is not even anything I think about. It's a no brainer. It's a habit. I take it every day and I can tell the difference since I've been taking it. It really works. I can tell you that when Alex looks at these products, he takes a lot of time, a lot of money to get the very best ingredients. They're things that he's proud of, things we can feel good about selling to you. It is a win-win situation. That has always been his goal in doing this. Everyone has to fund their operation one way or the other. That's the way he's chosen to do this. I think it's a great decision. If you want to look at the reviews on InfoWarsLife.com about X2, if you're not sure what it's, uh, how you would use it, what it's for, Look at the reviews. We've got over 400 reviews on InfoWarsLife.com. Over 99% of the respondents would recommend it to a friend or family member. Get your bottle of X2 
Read the reviews, over 400 of them, at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. Joining us now is Barbara Lowe Fisher. She's president of the National Vaccine Information Center. It's a nonprofit charity she co-founded with parents of DPT vaccine injured children back in 1982. So for decades, 30 years, over 30 years, she's been leading a national grassroots movement for public information to institute vaccine safety reform. So we're going to talk to her about the science, the policy, the law, the ethics, the politics of vaccination. Of course, so you can get more information about her organizations at nvic.org. That's National Vaccine Information Center. So that's nvic.org or nvicadvocacy.org. Joining us now is Barbara Low Fisher. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you. I would like to know, first of all, tell us all, because it, it's confusing when we try to follow these bills, when we try to follow the, uh, uh, the, the trade treaties that are working their way through the various ones. It's a very complicated process. Can you give us an overview, first of all, what's going on in California? And then let's talk about all these other laws that are being instituted across the country that would remove our informed consent, hold a gun to our heads to buy products for which the pharmaceutical companies have no product liability. Tell us first about California. Yes, well, as a lot of people know, in uh, January, we had a lot of publicity out of California, measles outbreaks associated with Disneyland. Uh, and what happened immediately with those, when those cases were reported, is that legislation started to be introduced in a number of states, including California, to remove or restrict the ability of Americans to take non-medical vaccine exemptions. That is, vaccines exemptions for religious, personal, philosophical, or conscientious beliefs. Uh, most of your followers probably know that we have vaccine laws in all the states. All states allow a medical exemption. All but two states, West Virginia and Mississippi, allow a religious exemption and about 17 states allow a personal, philosophical, or conscientious belief exemption. California is a state that has a personal belief exemption in, ad in addition to the medical exemption. Well, what happened was that several years ago, uh, legislators introduced a bill, AB 2109, to restrict the personal belief exemption, require people to get a doctor's signature in order to take that exemption. Well, they, they passed that law, and there has been a reduction in the numbers of people who take the personal belief exemption in California. Right now, it's about 2.5% of all children attending California schools have a personal belief exemption. Uh, but after the Disneyland outbreak, measles outbreak, they decided to come in, these same sponsors decided to come in and, and introduce SB 277, which would completely remove the personal belief exemption for religious and conscientious beliefs. Where we stand right now, despite protests uh, for the last three months where thousands of Californians have come to the Sacramento State Capitol with their children, many of them with their children, to testify in uh, the, the several uh, hearings that have been held in the, the Senate and in the House, uh, as well as attend rallies that were pro have been protesting, public rallies protesting this bill. Uh, the Senate passed it. The Assembly has just voted 46 to 30 to pass it, and it will soon be on Governor Brown's desk. Mm. And it is an extremely oppressive bill. It will mean that California will join West Virginia and Mississippi as three states, if, it, if Governor Brown signs it, uh, that only allow a medical exemption. Now, why this is so important uh, to, to have everyone who's in California contact Governor Brown and express their opinion about what they think about this bill is because in this country now, almost no medical condition qualifies for a medical exemption under federal guidelines. 99.99% of children and adults do not qualify for a medical vaccine exemption under federal guidelines. Those federal guidelines are followed by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, all the medical trade groups insist that their members follow the federal vaccine exemption guidelines. This means that almost no child will be qualified for a medical exemption. It means you have forced vaccination with a violation of the human right to inform consent to medical risk taking, violation of parental rights to make medical decisions for their children, 
Uh, and what they're basically saying in California and in states that don't have a personal leave exemption is that you must abandon the human right to inform consent to medical risk taking in order to enjoy the civil right to an, a, a school education. Yes. They want to move everyone into a ghetto. They want to punish you by using the stick of denying you getting into a school, even a private school. They even had homeschool at one point. They've removed that. But they're going to come after the homeschoolers. This is just a temporary uh, bargaining chip. I think they did that because they know the homeschoolers are going to fight them the hardest. So they took them out thinking they wouldn't fight. But I watched that uh, testimony. I watched the people line up there come to the microphone one at a time, give their names, a little bit about their background, and say, I oppose this bill. Of course, they ignored uh, the wishes of all those people. There are quite a few people there that identified themselves as homeschoolers, so they understand that they're next on the list. I, I think this is absolutely shameful. I think this is something that is worthy of Nazi Germany. When you're talking about exemptions, to me, that is only discussed because you're talking about something that's being mandated. We have a right to informed consent. That is our right as individuals. I read this uh, statement from you off of your website, uh, Barbara, earlier. This is, again, Barbara Lowe, co-founder of NVIC, the National Vaccine Information Center. This is at the top of your page. If the state can tag, track down, and force citizens against their will to be injected with biologicals of known and unknown toxicity today, there will be no limit on which individual freedoms the state can take away in the name of the greater good tomorrow. That is the essence of this. Wherever you come down on the science, and when I saw the uh, testimonies there, there were people who believed in the safety and the efficacy of vaccines, doctors and others who said this is a bad idea. They spoke up against taking away people's informed consent. That's exactly right. When you have a situation in this country uh, where we have always uh, cherished First Amendment rights, the right to freedom of thought, speech, conscience, religion, uh, and you you say that the government has the right to tell doctors to inject you with whatever they want to inject you with in terms of these vaccines. And we have to remember that when the, the legal precedent was set in 1905 in Jacobson versus Massachusetts, that affirmed the right of the states to mandate smallpox vaccine. There was only one vaccine. Today, the federal recommendations are 69 doses of 16 vaccines that children are supposed to get from day of birth to age 18 with 49 doses of 14 vaccines given by the age of six. Yes. This is a very different situation than we were talking about back, even if, and I disagree with Jacobson. I think Jacobson is a tragically yes. flawed decision on moral grounds, on scientific grounds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you can take it, the Jacobson versus Massachusetts, and Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1923 can use it to justify the forced sterilization of Carrie Buck in Virginia, yes. because she, he judged her to be mentally defective, and he did, he said, Three generations of imbeciles are enough. And enough. If you can have a eugenics decision based on Jacobson versus Massachusetts that 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 said the state can uh, force vaccination, that is an ethically flawed decision. And we know that and this is where this is ultimately going, and where a lot of this is coming from, don't we, Barbara? Because we look at informed consent. We look at what was said at the Nuremberg trials. They said we are going to enshrine informed consent because if you held to that principle. You can't have the kinds of things that happen in Auschwitz and elsewhere where they were, uh, Mingle and others were experimenting on people. They said they were doing it in the greater good. You know, we're going to do these horrific things in prisoner of war camps to people because we're going to find out about the human body. No, you don't experiment on people. This is not a problem of other countries either. We had the Tuskegee experiments, the injecting people, giving people syphilis without their consent, without their knowledge, telling them that they're going to get treatment, but then giving them placebos. That went on for decades against black people. We've had well, the CIA not. doing that as well. Yes, go ahead. Right. I mean, there are very famous experiments on mentally retarded children, hepatitis B vaccine experiments on, uh, on mentally retarded children in New York. Uh, or was it Illinois? I can't remember which 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 uh, asylum it was. But you know, we we absolutely have to understand that protecting the human right to informed consent to medical risk taking, and as you said, the Nuremberg trials 
which uh, the, the tribunal at the doctor's trial issued the Nuremberg Code. Now, yeah. even though that code specifically... Hang on, hang on right there. I want to pick up with the Nuremberg quote when we come back. We've got to take a commercial break, Barbara. We're talking to Barbara Lowe. Uh, from the uh, Bartolo Fisher, I'm sorry, from the National Vaccine Information Center. We'll be right back. Stay with us. I'm talking to Barbara Lowe Fisher. She's the president of the National Vaccine Information Center. They're tracking these mandatory bills that are working their way through the legislatures across this country, taking away our fundamental humanity, our right to informed consent. When you take that away, that is something that is far more dangerous than any disease, any outbreak, in my opinion. We cannot surrender our liberty in the idea that we think that it's going to make us safer. Slaves are never safe. To the extent that you give up your liberty, you become a slave to that degree, and you become less secure to that degree. Today, people value nothing more in this society than the promise of safety and security. It is a promise that cannot be delivered by these things that we are using to take away our fundamental rights as human beings. Before we had to go to the break, we were talking to uh, Barbara about uh, issues where they have violated people as human beings by taking away their informed consent, by experimenting on them as humans. Uh, Barbara, continue with that story that you were telling us about uh, hepatitis vaccines. Well, there, they, they, there has been... Many examples, not only in this country, but other countries, where doctors have taken upon themselves, taken the authority, used their authority to abuse human and civil rights and experiment on people uh, many times without them even knowing it. And, you know, when you look at the Nuremberg Code, you realize it did apply to human experimentation. But after the Nuremberg Code was issued, it was really applied to all medical procedures. When yeah. you go to a hospital, you see often on the walls, it says that you have, patients have rights and responsibilities. One of the rights is your right to refuse medical treatment or a drug that you think will harm you. Or if you are a parent, harm your child. That's called informed consent. And informed consent has been the standard, the gold standard in ethical practice of medicine since World War II. Here we are separating out vaccination from the informed consent principle and saying, oh, well, it doesn't apply to pharmaceutical products like vaccines, biological products that have an inherent ability to cause injury or death, that risk can be greater for some people than other people for biological and genetic reasons. What you have is a state basically adopting a one-size-fits-all approach. And, you know, it's an effective selection of the genetically vulnerable for sacrifice against their will. Yes. Because there are known and unknown genetic and biological high-risk factors that's that's really what it is. That's that and, was a very good point that you made at the uh, state, uh, the California state hearings on SB two seven seven. You pointed out that we don't. It's a very small number of people that will get a disease like measles that will have serious complications out of very small. But we don't know the numbers of people that are going to have adverse reactions, and we don't know who's going to have it because the vaccine science is not good enough to tell us who is genetically predisposed to have these kinds of reactions. So we're just playing Russian roulette with this. And the point you made, I think, was was very important. Who's to say that the people who have a genetic predisposition to adverse effects are less valuable than the people who have a genetic predisposition to have a serious effect from the disease itself. That's exactly right. And if you look at these, for the last few years, MBIC has been saying, know the risks and failures of vaccinations. If you look in California, uh, last year, 90% of the pediatric whooping cough cases, pertussis cases, that, that had vaccine records had been vaccinated. If you look at the measles outbreak from Disneyland, 30% of the individuals who were diagnosed with measles had been vaccinated. Only 18% of the total number of about 134 cases were children of school age. This bill is not about what, it, what their, the sponsors are saying it's about. They're saying it's about disease control and herd immunity. It's really about taking the power away from parents to make informed, voluntary decisions about vaccination for their children and giving it to doctors who have absolutely no liability and no accountability absolutely. whenever a child is injured or dies from vaccination. And that's the key point. And we're going to talk about that in the next segment. We don't have enough time to get into this segment. But that's the key point. When you're talking about the 
multiplication, the, the growth of the number of vaccines that people are given is growing exponentially. And it's only going to continue to grow because they have removed any legal liability from the pharmaceutical companies if they call something a vaccine. So now what do we see? We saw a couple of years ago, they just announced we're not going to mess with antibiotics anymore. We're going to just focus on vaccines. And when that happened, I kind of scratched my head. And I thought, what? I don't understand that. Now they, they said, well, because we're, we're overusing antibiotics and they're getting into the uh, supply so, uh, of food, so it's not being as effective. I now understand, after I, I didn't know at the time, but I now understand that because they have removed the liability for vaccines from these companies, that they can produce a vaccine for any situation and they have no incentive to make sure that it's safe because they have no liability on the back end. Stay with us. We're going to continue to talk to Barbara Lowe Fisher, president of the National Vaccine Information Center about medical tyranny. March. Alex Jones here with an exciting announcement. Do you have what it takes to join the InfoWar? Would you like to work here in Austin, Texas, inside the InfoWars News Center that now reaches more than 18 million people across the globe every week? We need info warriors. We need talented people who love the truth, who love freedom, and who love humanity to join our operation. We're going to be taking applications at the email jobs at infowars.com and online at infowars.com at infowars.com forward slash jobs. We're going to be hiring radio crew. We're going to be hiring writers. We're going to be hiring investigative journalists. We're going to be going out there directly to you, the patriots who love freedom all over this country who want to work inside our operation. Now, most of the hires will be inside InfoWars. Some can work remotely as writers. We're going to be hiring folks uh, directly on, but we're also going to be giving people a chance at paid internships to come in for a week, a month, or longer to see if you fit in to this operation. We're ready to go to the next level. Find out the details at infowars.com forward slash jobs or email us your resume, your video reel, uh, your background, what you stand for, and why you want to join the InfoWars crew. So whether you're an established journalist or whether uh, you're just a novice video editor, what matters is that you take action, that you stand for freedom, and that you want to work hard in defense of human liberties. We're looking for journalists. We're looking for writers. We're looking for investigative reporters. We're looking for folks to help promote freedom via our social media platforms, graphic designers, paid internships. And if folks have got a good resume and a good background, we'll also be hiring some people directly on at InfoWars.com as we prepare to take the fight to the next level against the new world order. In 20 years, InfoWars has been exponentially growing. We're about to hopefully take a huge leap forward when it comes to upping the amount of news we can cover, the amount of stories we can break, because world government is being rolled out in everybody's face right now. People are waking up. This is the time to have a maximum effort to reach out to humanity, and this is your chance to be part of the InfoWars.com news operations. So... Throw your hat in the ring if you think you've got what it takes. You're ready to take action. And I hope to be working side by side with you right here at the InfoWars.com News Centers in Austin, Texas. So send those video reels. Send those graphic designs. Send your work to us so we can see if you've got what it takes to be part of this operation. And again, we finance our growth with your support, and we want to help you support your health. That's why we sell the kind of products that we do. This segment of Alex Jones is brought to you by Clean Water. The way you can get that, if you're on the city water supply, even if you're on a well, the way you can make sure you're getting that, of course, is with water filters. That's why Alex and I both use ProPure water filters from InfoWarsStore.com. You know, we're talking to Barbara Lowe Fisher about mandatory vaccines they've been putting fluoride in your water without your informed consent for a very long time i mean you can have the argument whether you want to i'll argue that and we've made this case many times about the health risks of fluoride we know that it is harmful but let's just take the argument that it is not harmful for you why would you ever medicate people through the water supply how could you ever control the dosage 
even if it was effective, even if it was safe, why would you do that in the water supply? You can take action to stop that yourself. And, of course, you can get the new ProPure water pitcher filters that filter fluoride right now for 20% off until the end of June while supplies last. This filter can be used for travel. And, again, it filters fluoride. You can also find filters uh, that will uh, filter out glyphosate if you're on a well. You still have to be concerned about that. So many people are using Roundup. that Glyphosate can get into the aquifer. You can get that even if you're not on a city water system where they're intentionally dumping chemicals into your water. Again, the special will expire in four days. It's through the end of June. It's a 20% off of ProPure water filters at the InfoWarsStore.com. Going back to uh, Barbara Lowe Fisher, the National Vaccine Information Center, we've been talking about the civil liberties issues, the legal issues. We've just began to touch on some of the health issues. We were talking before the break about how they are magnifying the number of vaccines that we are required to take. Uh, we have to take them on a schedule. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, seen the article or not, Barbara, but I talked to Michelle Roden of uh, Nurses Against Mandatory Vaccines. Uh, I think it was May 1st I talked to her about how they're holding a gun to the heads of health professionals to force them to take vaccines. That's the way they do it. They say, oh, you still have informed consent. It's just if you don't do it, you can't go to school. You can't have a job. But, you know, you can still uh, we still technically have informed consent they're not giving people informed consent. And when I was talking to her, she talked to me about her specialty is uh, intensive care unit for preemies. And she was saying they are so rigidly on this schedule that even though they had premature babies, very low birth weight, they knew that it was going to have a, a, a toxic effect on them. They were going to have to intubate them. They were uh, at very high risk for uh, sepsis and other things, respiratory issues. They knew that was going to happen. They said, get ready. We're going to vaccinate these preemies because it's on schedule and we have to slavishly follow that schedule. That was bombshell information. And less than one month later, uh, Barbara, we saw a she found a uh, journal of the American Medical Association report verifying that in a very large study of over 13,000 infants, they had verified precisely this. And yet they did not say that the physicians would ever not vaccinate. That was never a part of the discussion, even though it was harming them. So we've not only lost the idea of informed consent, but we've lost the idea of first, do no harm. Oh, absolutely. The first do no harm precautionary principle has completely been abandoned by federal health officials and state health officials and by doctors. It's extremely dangerous. And, you know, I, I'm reminded of a quote by Edie Bazell who said, you know, when you take an idea or a concept and turn it into an abstraction, you take people and turn them also into abstractions. When we turn people into abstractions, what is left? You know, the fact that they are not seeing that each individual is not, we're not all the same. We don't all respond the same way to pharmaceutical products. Those preemies, those low weight uh, babies in the newborn nursery, uh, you know, to, to have a one-size-fits-all approach to vaccination and have a rigid schedule where you don't take into account variab variabilities between people is, is shocking and it's dangerous. And the only thing that stands between us and tyranny, the, 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 I, I said in my testimony, the right of the state to tell us what to, to do to the bodies of our children ends where our right as parents to protect our children's lives begins. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. When they talk about exemptions, what they're talking about is taking fundamental human rights and turning them into privileges that are granted by the government and they can just be wiped away by the government the next day. That, that's right. And that's why I've always said for 20 years, I've been saying the human right to inform consent to medical risk taking is a it is a right that we must protect in this country. How can we protect it? Right now, we can protect it by securing flexible medical, religious, and conscientious belief exemptions in all public health policies and laws, including vaccine policies and laws. Yeah. Uh, what, what do we do? I mean, I like the message I just heard at the break uh, that Alex Jones was, was saying. We have to get involved. We, yeah. have, we can't just sit in our houses on our comfortable couches and watch TV every night and not understand that if we don't get involved in this democracy, we're going to lose our freedoms. Yeah. And the first freedom is going to be having any kind of control over what is put into our bodies and our children's bodies.
Absolutely. We see over and over again, Barbara, when people will stand up in mass and make demands on the government that is supposed to serve them, they will back down. We have seen this over and over again. They will come at you from a different direction. They will continue to come on. I mean, the fight for freedom and liberty is something that never ends. It, it, it requires eternal vigilance, but it is something we can back them down. We have seen this over and over again. When I look at the situation, and, and again, we, we can talk about the science and we have talked about the science, but to me, the fundamental thing and is, is the civil liberties issue. I look yes. at the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have a religious belief that they don't want to do blood transfusions. I don't share that belief. I think the blood transfusions are are something that I would have. I would have that for my family under certain cir circumstances. I mean, there's been horrific uh, problems with contamination within uh, the blood supply, but that wasn't why they came after. They didn't give you a, a an argument from uh, the efficacy issue. They just said it's against our religion to do that. I support their right to make that choice. I don't understand why people would give that up. They don't understand that they're giving up their own humanity when they hold a gun to your head, force you to buy a product and inject that product in yourself and in your family for which the seller has no financial liability. I cannot understand that. It's just so far beyond anything. But that's what we see over and over again. The big corporations so totally owning the government that they are yes. using the government no more just to to get advantage. What they used to do in the old days was they get advantage from uh, their smaller competitors. Today, they use the government to hold a gun to your head to compel you to buy their products. And that's fundamentally what this is about. Well, it is. And now there is a public-private financial partnership uh, since 911, the BioShield legislation and other legislation has formed a, a, a an official Congress has formed allowed the agent, federal agencies to form a financial partnership with the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry is way too present and powerful within federal agencies, including NIH uh, and, and Department of Health and Human Services, the CDC, FDA. And what's happened is when you've got government making a, a, a financial deal with pharma, and you are and, and the FDA is supposed to have some regu you know, regulating these products for safety and for effectiveness. And if you've got the FDA paying, I mean, the pharmaceutical companies paying the FDA to fast track to licensure yeah. new vaccines, and yeah. so salaries are being paid by pharma money, you are not going to get really an honest evaluation and you have the policymakers at the cdc making policy to uh to recommend these vaccines for universal use that universal use recommendation is taken by state health officials and that's how mandates are created and as i said in my testimony in california to these legislators this legislation sb 277 that takes away personal belief exemption has a, a sentence in there that is going to allow health officials to add new vaccines to this, the required list, and the legislators have no vote. Yes, yes, and there's no end to what they're going to do. They've already said they're going to stop working on antibiotics, and they have. They're going to make everything a vaccine, and the fundamental issue for that, of course, is the vaccine court. Talk to us about that. That was something that was created back in 1986. Why? Because they were having a lot of people who were suing because of adverse reactions. So what they did was they gave them legal immunity by setting up this vaccine court. Tell us a little bit about I, that. I was there. I was one of the parents that was there in the early 1980s. And what the drug company said to Congress was, we are going to leave this country with no childhood vaccines if you do not protect us from liability in civil court. The doctors were also threatening to not give vaccines. So what did the Congress do? We came to the table. They told us, you can come to the table and fight for what you think the family should get. But we are passing this legislation with or without you. We came and we fought for, the, for, for parents and for children. And we said we will never agree to a, a, that you would completely protect the pharmaceutical companies and doctors from liability. It's got to be a choice. People could either go to federal uh, compensation or they could or they could sue the companies and doctors. But at the end of the day, we were not we were as powerful as the companies and as the doctors, the, the medical trade organizations. And they passed legislation that protected. It gave partial liability protection to the companies. It gave pretty much complete liability protection to the doctors. In 2011, the Supreme Court came in, and what the Supreme Court said was, vaccines are unavoidably unsafe. 
There shall be no more product liability for any reason for vaccines in, in terms of the companies having any product liability. That was the day that we, within a few months, we saw the legislation start to be introduced in these states, like Washington and Vermont, to try to take away the personal belief exemption. Now, what's happened this year across the country? Vermont lost its uh, the philosophical exemption, but they retained a religious exemption. They have religious and medical. Oregon and Washington, that legislation was basically shelved. They were not able to take away the personal belief exemption in either of those states. 20 bills in Texas failed. All of them failed. Why did they fail? Because we have had very active people in Texas, including Don Richardson, who was our director of state advocacy for 20 years. She's worked down there. And when you when people are involved in the political process, when they talk to their legislators, when they get involved on a personal basis, you can hold back this encroachment on civil liberties. And Texas is a very good example. Yes. My message is the same as your message. We must get involved in our democracy. And, and one of the ways that we do that, let me get this to you. You've got information about what the status of different bills are on a state by state basis. That's at NVICadvocacy.org. Is that correct? That's right. All right. Five years ago, in 2010, we created this advocacy portal. It's free. You would then uh, you come in and you are a user of the portal, and we, in your email box, you will receive emails when vaccine bills are being introduced in your state, particularly those that will take away your freedom. Or in some states, we're trying to get wider exemptions in the state. So you'll, you are able then to be put into direct electron, electronic contact with your own legislator, and you get email alerts about rallies, about uh, the status of the legislation as it moves through your, your state. And you can then participate in the process. So it's a great educational tool, communications tool, and advocacy tool that allows you to participate on the, on the issue of vaccine bills. That's very important that people go there and look at that. And, and again, multiply your effectiveness by having people who are going to know precisely what's going on there. That's NVIC, National Vaccine Information Center, NVIC.org. And then there's NVICadvocacy.org where they can find out what's going on on a state by state level. When you're talking about this and you're talking about how the government said uh, they had to have the vaccine court because they knew that the product was unsafe. The Supreme Court extends this blanket protection to them saying uh, uh, we know that they're inherently unsafe. It's, a, it's a, an admission that their product is not safe and yet they continue down this pike. People need to understand that the government is not there in an adversarial relationship looking at the products of big pharma. This is regulatory capture. This is crony capitalism. This yeah. is corruption in our government. We're going to see far more of this with these trade promotion agreements uh, if they allow these uh, trade treaties to go through. We'll come back uh, in just a, uh, right after the break. We're going to continue to talk to Barbara Lowe Fisher, president of the National Vaccine Information Center. Stay with us. We are talking to Barbara Lowe Fisher, president of the National Vaccine Information Center, about the bill that is very close to passing in California in spite of massive public opposition. They're ramming this thing through. It has cleared both houses of the legislature. It is going to the governor's desk. Uh, many believe that he will sign it, but it hasn't been done yet. There is still an opportunity to put pressure on him. She has the uh, National Vaccine Information Center, it's NVIC.org. Also, the NVICadvocacy.org will help you to know what's going on in your state in terms of bills that are up. And as she pointed out here in Texas, we had over 20 uh, bills that would take away our informed consent in various degrees uh, presented to the state legislature this year. Uh, thanks to people getting together and working collectively at NVICadvocacy.org, as well as people getting involved as citizens. We have beaten those down in Texas. Other states have had victories as well. It looks like it's not going that way in California. Uh, in this last segment, uh, I want to continue to talk about what we were talking about in the last segment, uh, Barbara, and that is the naive idea that uh, somehow somebody is watching out for the safety of these uh, vaccines for which the big pharmaceutical companies have absolutely no liability. That's why we have the vaccine court. Many people have never heard of that. We need to make sure people understand that because that tells you right there 
that there's something that stinks about this relationship. This regulatory capture, we've seen GMO say, uh, or uh, Monsanto say the same thing about GMO, saying we don't have to verify that our products are safe. That's the job of the FDA. And I think many people think, oh, the FDA is looking out for us. They're testing all these vaccines. They're not. The pharmaceutical companies and the AMA are just allowed to multiply these things out there as required uh, coming from the CDC. They're actually working with the industry to do that, coming up with a schedule that they slavishly follow, even if it creates known problems for low birth weight babies, premature babies. They continue to push on with this. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, it... People need to become educated about this issue. They need to understand when they go into a doctor's office and they're pressured to get these vaccines. And the, the last thing you want to do is not have information, not understand your personal and family medical history, not understand what the vaccines are, what the ingredients are, whether or not, you know, what the tests are, that they, the clinical trials are that they uh, use to prove that the vaccine was, quote, safe. I've been saying for for many years that the standards are way too low at the FDA for proof of safety and effectiveness of these vaccines. It's really up to the consumer to get educated and then empower yourself by getting involved in the political process. Make sure you elect people who you know are going to have integrity and are going to vote in a way that is going to protect your civil liberties and your human rights. It's really our democracy is about who we elect to govern us. These laws that are, have been coming out in the last 10, 15 years that are taking away our liberties, including our right to inform consent to, to medical risk-taking, vaccine risk-taking, are extremely dangerous, as you pointed out and we pointed out in this hour. So, And, of course, people can find out more information at your website about the medical issues. We barely touched that because it's such an overriding issue that could, should concern everybody, regardless of what they think about vaccines. They should recoil in horror at the removal of our fundamental human right of informed consent. Because as you pointed out, once they do that, once they can, can inject toxins into you without your consent, without proper oversight, as we've talked about with the uh, government, they can do anything to you. You are essentially their slave. It is a form of medical tyranny writ large. Yes, yes it's a slippery slope. Once they can do anything they want to to your body or the yes. body of your child, you well, know, thank you so that, much. That really, what else can they do? They can basically do anything. Absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Barbara Lowe Fisher, president of the National Vaccine Information Center. You can find more information at NVIC.org. Educate yourself. Educate your uh, friends and family and neighbors about this. This is an imperative issue, not only about the vaccines, but about our human rights. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host. We were just talking in the last segment to Barbara Lowe Fisher of the National Vaccine Information Center about what's going on in California. It looks like they're going to ram through mandatory vaccines, take away people's informed consent. But as she pointed out, this is a national movement. And we defeated it here in Texas. We had over 20 bills uh, with the assistance of uh, the information you can find at the National Vaccine uh, Information Center and NVICadvocacy.org, where you can find out the bills in your state. By people getting active in Texas, they were able to shut that down. It's a very important thing to remember, to understand. You know, we had a bill that was uh, put out by David Simpson to basically remove marijuana from the Texas Code. He said it's a natural substance. You talk about informed consent. When they can take away your right to medicate yourself, they can also take away your right to refuse medication. We talked about the right to refuse medication. Here in Texas, that bill from David Simpson did not pass, but they did pass a bill that would allow people to have medical marijuana if they or their children, in most cases it's children, were suffering from continuous seizures. Why is that happening so frequently? There was a very interesting case in Charlotte, North Carolina. There was another one that was in, I believe it was Boston. Uh, we heard testimony during the SB 277 hearings in California. A uh, man was testifying, his educational lawyer, testifying that the same thing had happened to his child. I see all of these cases happening across the country. And one of the things that David Simpson had said was the only thing these people whose children were suffering as a result of this uh, adverse reaction to a vaccine that gave them continuous life-threatening seizures, the only thing that stopped that was medical marijuana. And it was a shame that they had to go all the way to Colorado to do that, to face arrest here 
in Texas. That has also changed in Texas. We now have the ability to take medical marijuana for that particular and only for that particular uh, ailment. But that right there tells you that it should no longer be a class one uh, drug. It does have medical uses. It has been recognized by the state of Texas as well as many others. We have an amazing video. And I want to get just to some uh, uh, kind of miscellaneous stories that we've got. We've got an amazing video up on uh, Infowars.com. Shocking video emerges of girl being attacked while holding a toddler. I want to play a little bit of that video. Let's let's roll that here. <laughs> get it. Oh! Damn, they really are scared to fight. Oh, is that some part of it? Oh, 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 That is an amazing video. Just grabbed her by the hair and is dragging her along the ground. She had the baby in her arms. The baby fell on the ground. Now she's just beating her on the ground. This is a racially motivated attack, unfortunately. Just insane. That's a video. You can see that on Infowars.com. It's gone viral. There's over 6 million views of that. It's just absolute insanity we've seen this week. From the bills that have been passed by the, uh, uh, by the Supreme Court to what we see happening with these trade treaties, it is absolute insanity. Absolutely no reason or rhyme to anything that seems to be happening in this country anymore. Uh, nevertheless... The problem is the Confederate flag. Or maybe it's the climate. Maybe, uh, you know, it's your car. Maybe too much exhaust. Forget about the sun. The Pope says it's you. You're the problem. Not their private jets that they fly around to their climate summits. It's you. Stay with us. We're going to be right back with Mark Dice. Joining us this hour is Mark Dice. And, of course, you've seen his videos on our website many, many times. Mark does a great job of illustrating the absurdity and the idiocracy of current society. We're going to go to him in just a moment, but first I want to tell you this hour, the Alex Jones Show is brought to you by your support of the purchasing our high-quality products from InfoWarsLife.com. Of course, that's the way that we fund this operation. We want your support as well as to support your health. Right now, we've just got back in supply uh, X2 nascent iodine. Last week, we told you that it was out of supply. We have now uh, been able to get it back. Uh, we just got an emergency shipment from our manufacturer. It's uh, available right now. If you don't have it in stock, you need to stock up on it. It's one of those things like food, like ammunition. You always need to be prepared with the things that are essential to life. And, of course, nutrients are essential to life. It's just just the same as food is. X2 has over 400 reviews on InfoWarsLife.com. Over 99% of the respondents would recommend it to a friend or family member. We've absolutely been blown away by this response. Get your bottle of X2. Read the 400 reviews about it on InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. And joining us now is Mark Dice, media analyst, social critic, political activist, author, and, of course, his videos are always amusing and controversial. He's got commentaries, protests, boycotts. His newest book is The Bilderberg Group, Facts and Fiction. Joining us now is Mark Dice. Welcome, Mark. Hi, glad to be here. Good to, good to be with you, David. Now, you, you've had uh, a lot of very, very successful videos. They always go viral because you have a wonderful way of uh, putting this in a satire. I think the way that we illustrate uh, absurdity, uh, the way we can change people's minds is to illustrate the absurdity and really, I think, kind of the profound ignorance. I mean, we've been seeing a lot of that this last week. That seems to be the uh, ongoing uh, theme of this last week. Uh, you just had a video out about uh, selling a 10-ounce silver bar that was uh, worth $160. Uh, you couldn't uh, get that sold, right? <laughs> and this is, you'll see the video, this is right in front of a coin shop. And <laughs> just to illustrate that the general public have no idea about the value of precious metals, it might as well have been a block of wood that I was trying to sell them. <laughs> some of the people in the comments and some of the people who are skeptical say, oh, well, they just didn't buy it because they thought it was a scam. There's a lot of fake silver bars out there, which there are fake silver bars out there. But in this case, they just didn't have a clue what it was worth. And I did this specifically right in front of me, 40 feet away from a coin shop. Yeah. And I would tell them, we can go inside this coin shop that's been there for generations in this community, and we can verify that this is real. And it, as you'll see, just person after person 
didn't want it, not because they thought it was a scam, but because to them it might as well have just been a chunk of steel or, or a block of wood. Yeah, of course, I say, you know, there's there it could be uh, phony silver. You know, there's a lot of phony paper money out there, isn't there, Mark? I mean, <laughs> that's kind of the point. Let's roll a clip of that uh, that video. I'm Mark Dice, standing outside this coin shop with a 10-ounce silver bar of pure silver bullion worth about $160, where I'm going to try to sell it to random people for $10, just to see if they know anything about silver. Having a special today, it's a 10-ounce silver bar for $10. It's okay. 99 cents an ounce if you're doing That's pretty cool. Can I touch you? Oh, that's pretty cool. Would you be interested in purchasing that? Uh, not today. Not today. I'm actually on a mission right now. For 99 cents an ounce? I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> Do the math for them in case they can't worry. I'm good, man. You don't want it? Yeah. You just got too many of them laying around oh, the house? Just so many, dude. Just, just yeah. taking up too much space? <laughs> just in the way. <laughs> just need to clear out some of those silver bars. I know, man. I should start spending them. Okay, I'll go find someone who wants the silver <laughs> bar. Then. Yeah, man. All right, thank that. you. You don't have $10? How much do you have on you? I got some food stamps. We can go into the coin shop over here. We can verify that it's Simon. real. I got to get going. Oh, oh thanks. Three. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> uh, Five dollars for the silver no, bar? No, thanks. 99 cents. No. Just give me 99 cents for this 10-ounce silver bar. I'm okay, thank Why you. Why not? I don't really want it. You don't want it? No. Not even for 99 cents? No, it's cool. So better things to spend your money on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> give me a 10-ounce silver bar for a dollar. It's a 10-ounce silver bar for $10 if you're interested. Uh, oh, no, thank you. $5. No, no, no. 99 cents. No, no, I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you. 99 cents. I for have no cash on me at all. 99? You got to want to trade it for a piece of gum or something? No, I don't even have gum. No. It's a little uh, noodle bowl. A noodle bowl. Yeah. Uh, give me that noodle bowl, and I'll give you this 10-ounce bar of silver. I know some people that will definitely say yes to you. I can send your way. That you, are you're not interested? I'm not. I'm just, I'm sorry. I have a lot going on. How much on. did that noodle bowl cost you? $1.99. Okay, so you'd rather have that than a worthless 10-ounce bar of silver? At this point, At yes. This I'm point. sorry. <laughs> sorry, you guys. <laughs> 10 bucks for this? 10 bucks for that? No, I'm good. You don't want to buy it for ten dollars? I just trying to get a burger. You know they don't take ten ounce silver bars at the burger joints. So. What do you? What it's a do little you tarnished? You know. Yeah, sorry, man. Can't ten help. bucks? No, I can't you know, help you, man. We got too many of them laying around. Oh, I just got like sacks okay, and sacks. Okay, you can see more. Of that. You know, dude. That, that's amazing, Mark. You know. <laughs> I, I guess maybe you should have taken plastic. Uh, maybe maybe they would have been interested. <laughs> they wanted instant gratification. Oh, man, I got my noodle bar. I got a, a burger I want to get. <laughs> it, like I said, it, within 60 seconds, they could have walked into this coin shop and yeah. they could have walked out with $160 approximately in cash. I mean, they would have verified that it was real in two seconds. And it, it literally might as well have been a, a block of wood. Yeah. Just absolutely clueless. You know, I've done this with a gold coin you know, gold's fluctuated a few hundred dollars over the last few years, but, and I can't remember exactly what the price was, but the gold coin was worth well over a thousand dollars, thirteen hundred to fifteen hundred dollars, doing the same thing, trying to sell it for twenty bucks in front of the same coin shop. And they just simply had no idea. And it wasn't that they thought it was fake. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we got another video lined up here about banning gold coins. Yeah, I bet if you had asked them what the spot price of uh, silver is, they wouldn't have any idea what that was either. They probably don't understand that our money was supposed to be backed by gold or silver either. Let's take a look at this video about banning gold and gold coins because, uh, you know, we, we got to have that uh, Federal Reserve notes. Let's take a look at that video. What we're doing is um, so many people have been buying and hoarding gold mm -hmm. and that's really detrimental uh, for the economy. So we're just going to ban the uh, possession of physical gold coins for the okay. citizens and get that money back into the Fort Knox and into the government's hands where it belongs. So, yeah, thank you for supporting banning gold coins. A lot of these people are hoarding their gold coins and we just are going to make them cash them in and that will stimulate the economy and put the gold back in the Federal Reserve vaults and birth date to ban the possession of physical gold coins. So you don't need your gold coins. The government needs the gold. And so we've done this before and we're going to do it again. Thank you so much for supporting that. <laughs> what is 
wrong with these people? Obama wants us to cash in our gold, have a cash for gold program to stimulate the economy. Okay. And we just want to show support for the, right. that. Just uh, in the past, we've had a mandatory uh, cash for gold program, yeah. uh, birth date, and we're going to just have people uh, turn in their gold coins okay. and we're going to ban the, the possession of gold. You don't need your gold coins, so okay. thanks for supporting right, the uh, banning of gold okay. coins. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> that's great. People don't need that, that's just amazing, Mark. I, you know, you, you get people to do the most amazing things, and of course, People who don't know, you know, I, I, many people said uh, Americans today know the price of everything, the value of nothing. I don't know if these people even know the price of anything. <laughs> they certainly don't know the value of gold and silver. And I guess they could care less that it's in our Constitution. You've got a couple of videos we're going to show later, probably uh, the uh, petition to repeal the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights. I mean, they don't they don't understand anything, it seems like. No, these, these aren't stooges. This isn't, I mean, on one level, I guess it is satire because I'm presenting a, an insane position, but these are real people just that are randomly walking down the beach. And it shows a few different things. I think that many people are just beyond ignorant. They're just lost in an entertainment wasteland, but they're also so manipulative or so mm -hmm. manipulatable rather. Yes. If somebody, you know, I present myself as a figure, authority figure and in a commanding presence and a commanding voice, I tell them what should be done, and they, they follow blindly along. And this is the same psychological strategy that led to Nazi Germany, you know, exterminating millions of people, murdering them on an industrial scale because the authority figures told them to do it, said this is what needed to be done. That's, and precisely, doing that's precisely what we were just talking about throughout the last hour. I was talking with Barbara Lowe Fisher of uh, National Vaccine Information Center. Of course, it's in California where you're doing these men on the streets. Uh, Using authority figures, using a guy taking the lead on this, Dr. Pan, telling people that he's going to take away their informed consent and it's for their own good. And they, they can't think through the issues. They're not engaged. They're not even understanding what's going to happen to them. They're turning themselves into slaves, taking, giving up their fundamental human rights of informed consent. You know, people are so easily manipulatable today. It's astounding if you just tell them. And most of these petition videos, I start off by telling the people, this is what Obama wants or this is what's mm -hmm. good for them. And mm -hmm. they, I mean, as we'll see later in the broadcast, they want to just repeal the Bill of Rights, anything for Obama. You know, put carcinogens in the water supply, uh, add infanticide to Obamacare. This is beyond idiocracy. And this isn't just one or two different subjects. I mean, I'm looking back at all these videos I've produced over the last few years. It's It's got to be 35 petition videos alone, 35 different insane, anti-American, ludicrous things that these people signed their name, birthday, and signature to approve. Exactly. They just argue from authority. And that's why I said when we saw this happening with the Pope, he's not arguing. He's not making a scientific argument. He's just arguing from authority. And that's the argument about global warming. They put this out there for the longest time, said the majority of us agree. Well, you know what? The majority of them said the earth was flat at one point in time. Stay with us. We're going to be right back with Mark Dice. We're going to look at more videos. We're joined by Mark Dice, and we've been looking at some of his uh, funny petition videos that really kind of illustrate the ignorance of people, but also the susceptibility of people to follow someone who is an authority, as Mark Dice pointed out. Of course, that's the thing that he does so well in these videos, just egging them along, gradually assuring them that they're doing the right thing, speaking from authority. It was funny, Mark, when I looked at this, uh, one of the things I was thinking about during the break when these people, uh, these last two videos we looked at, you offered them a 10-ounce silver bar uh, for $10 that was uh, worth $160. I didn't want to uh, uh, make that exchange. It kind of reminded me of when my kids were little and they might have two $1 bills and um, uh, I might have two $1 bills and they've got a five and I offer them, <laughs> would you like these two for that? And it's like, yeah, that's, that's a good deal. <laughs> they have absolutely no idea of its worth. They are like children. It is incredible. I mean, the analogy of America being an idiocracy is completely accurate. These people have an attention span of, of, of a goldfish. They have the common sense of a five-year-old. And just week after week in the Man on the Street Monday segments, I've been demonstrating it. I'm very thankful that InfoWars has been posting a lot of these videos. The Drudge Report's been picking them up. 
And, mm-hmm. and I think that resonate with so many people because those of us who you know want to improve America, those of us who are trying to be informed, we look at these people and they're just a shame. Uh, they're just a stain on this country of what was once the great United States of America. And so hopefully through people sharing these videos, uh, many of the audience, uh, not this audience, but you know, people who share the videos on their Facebook pages, et cetera, a lot of the people who stumble across them may be almost ign- as ignorant as the people in the videos. And so hopefully it's planting seeds of common sense, yeah. seeds to pay attention to current events and history, uh, seeds to you know, just kind of unplug yourself from the matrix. And they're using this all the time. I mean, we see, uh, as you point out, if you tell people this is for Obama, they'll do it. That's why they had the Pope come out and sign up for climate change, because they want world government. And that's what the scientist, uh, Shellen Huber, that was with him, that's what he's been pushing for a very long time. He wants a uh, a world uh, constitu- an Earth constitution. He wants a planetary council to enforce these regulations. But, of course, the argument is from the authority of the Pope. And people don't ask what the scientific basis of this is. They don't question his assumptions. We're not allowed to look at the data or the models. They don't understand what's involved here. It's simply an argument from authority, whether it's the Pope or whether it's Obama. It's always from authority. You've got another uh, uh, petition where you ask people to sign uh, this petition and see if they would support putting carcinogens in the water supply. Of course, that's been happening. <laughs> Maybe this for may be, you know, I want to, I want to add something. It's also celebrities as authority figures. People yeah. blindly follow the celebrities. Oh, and yeah, some definitely. of the, some of the videos I've done one recently, I just told people that Beyonce, you know, called for the repeal of the bill of rights and the first amendment. And, uh, you know, Beyonce wanted Sharia law in the inner cities to, you know, just to help out with the minority communities. And these people just as easily, agreed and followed this and yeah you know, we can replace the rule of law with twerking i guess you know that's <laughs> we have you the know, supreme make, court make, twerk next <laughs> you know this next video is to add carcinogens which of course are cancer causing materials into the water supply which you know maybe could explain for the the vast uh, idiocracy uh, mental enslavement in america maybe they are consuming too many carcinogens their their brains have become toxified but here we have again mm-hmm. it's it, just using key words, this is to help you. This is what we need to have. And I think we have one later lined up where I got people to sign a petition, and I didn't even tell them what it was for whatsoever. Nothing even remotely, no issue, nothing. Just this is for Obama. He needs you to sign. I, I think we have that one. We'll play yeah. that one next. Let's but. play a little bit of this clip about the uh, carcinogens in the water supply. With Obamacare in effect, the health care system is going to cost the taxpayers a lot of money. So. Uh, birth date there. Uh, so we're going to add some carcinogens to the water supply just so everybody gets uh, a dose of carcinogens and yeah, signature to support adding the carcinogens. Thank you, sir. Uh, a lot of people don't get enough carcinogens, and so uh, we just figured, you know, we're going to just get people to sign the petitions to to support adding the carcinogens. Cool, Thank you, and cool. have a good time drinking those carcinogens. <laughs> with with Obamacare going into effect, we just want to make sure to add the, the carcinogens to the water supply just to keep people nice and healthy. And yeah, print there. To we need more carcinogens, so we're just going to add them to the water supply, and then everybody can get a good even dose of it. Yeah, that, that reminds me, Mark, of a of a petition that. Uh Leanne McAdoo did, where she went around and asked people to ban dihydrogen di- monoxide, you know, H2O, otherwise known as water. <laughs> We're going to be right back with Mark Dice. We're going to take a look at some more of these amazing petitions. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Joining us this hour has been and continues to be Mark Dice, media analyst, social critic, political activist, author. He's been in documentary films. He has a website, markdice.com, and, of course, his newest book, Bilderberg Group, Fact and Fiction, Mark is best known, however, for his petitions, and we've been looking at these petitions, very humorous, but illustrating a very important point, and that is how susceptible people are to following the influential leaders, following authority, doing whatever they're told. And we're going to go back to Mark, we're going to take a look at some more of these petitions. Before we do, though, this segment of the Alex Jones Show is made possible by our products in the Made in 1776 clothing line. Everything in the Made in 1776 line is made right here in the U.S. You don't have to 
Uh, get big box uh, retailers clothing that's made by slave labor in China and other countries. Everything is made right here in the U.S. For a limited time, you can get 25% off of our best-selling Molon Lave belt buckles. Don't buy low-quality slave goods at Walmart or other stores. Support us, support InfoWars, support American-made products. Support our Made in 1776 clothing line at InfoWarsStore.com. We have the Moulin Lave belt buckles, the Save America t-shirt. That's the one with the distress uh, flag that's upside down. The Moulin Lave hoodie and many other products. That's at InfoWarsStore.com. Click on Made in 1776 on the left-hand side. It's a good way to engage people in conversations even if you don't have a petition, you know, you can start talking about some uh, important, interesting stuff. But the way Mark Dice does it is with petitions. And, Mark, you had a petition that uh, really kind of created a stir about uh, asking people if they would support uh, nuking China. You had one uh, about nuking Russia. That went uh, pretty big. But you've got another one here about nuking uh, China. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, a few weeks ago, it made international news, the Nuke Russia petition. Yeah. Uh, it, it, obviously, many other countries, probably the adults, probably quite informed, trying to you know improve their country and their communities. But unfortunately, in America, we're in this phase of the cycle of civilizations where most people are just lackadaisical and lazy and have tuned out. And so the petition to nuke Russia for Obama made uh, quite an international buzz overseas, angering and upsetting, stunning uh, many of the Russians. And yeah, so didn't, somebody in Russia, didn't somebody in Russia do a, a, a petition in Russia and they found that the Russian people did not say, no, let's go nuke the United States? Several different news agencies or journalists or YouTubers did a similar petition asking Russians to nuke Americans, and they were stunned. Uh, I think maybe one or two people supported it. Most of them said this was the, the most ludicrous idea. It doesn't solve anything. And, you know, it's one thing to sign a petition to support a piece of legislation that they might not be familiar with that's presented to them as if this is what Obama wants. But I, I wanted to see how far would these people go? What would they do? What would they approve exactly? They would approve of starting a nuclear war with Russia. So I followed up to see, you know, let's start a nuclear war with China. Are the American people willing to support President Obama launching a preemptive nuclear strike <laughs> into China? as a solution to the Chinese hackers hacking into the American government's computer system. Oh, yeah, that sounds perfectly reasonable and proportional. Let's, let's take a look at that petition. President Obama needs a few more signatures to uh, support his nuclear response to the Chinese hackers. So we're just out here getting signatures for the White House. I just need you to print birthday and a signature. You know, these hackers keep on hacking into our systems, and so... President Obama wants to respond with a nuclear strike in Beijing. Yep, and a signature there to support the nuclear strike. It's really the only thing we can do to stop these hackers is okay. to launch a nuclear attack. Okay. Thank you for supporting right, that. You, appreciate yeah, that. Appreciate it. Have yeah. a good nuclear winter. You're Obama supporter? Yeah, dude. All right. Oh, yeah. yeah. You want to help us sign too? <laughs> I mean, the Chinese are always stealing our patents, and now they're stealing our intellectual property. And so, yep, birthday. So, and of course, President you got Obama, Obama shirt on, so that, a, that makes a, all the difference. A nuclear message with a with a nuclear strike, just as a final, uh, once and for all, to, just to stop them. Okay. Thank you for supporting you. that. Right. Not necessarily that these people want to nuke China. It's that they will just support whatever Obama says. So their brains just shut off when I say, "Will you help support Obama's plan?" Brain shuts off, and they'll do just about anything I say into our system and they've got now the names right, and the right. security clearances of every federal employee so we just need your support to to approve of president obama's response which includes a nuclear strike <laughs> into beijing uh just print right there birth date and a signature it's the nuclear response to the chinese hackers president obama says that's the only way we can stop them is to launch a nuclear strike into Beijing. So we just need a few more signatures to support that. Thank you so much. That guy, I thought he was walking President away from Obama you there. He didn't want to be involved, but you, you drew him in there with the that. Uh, hackers. You I think it was for Obama, didn't you? The government system. And yeah, let's go back. Let's go back to Mark. That, that That's pretty amazing. They will do anything. And that that is what's so scary. You talked about People doing signing up for things, and maybe you could excuse it by saying that they're not familiar with those items. You know, actually, you could make that argument here, I guess, because Americans really aren't familiar with war. 
Most of them haven't seen it. You know, people in Russia, Mark, have experienced that. I mean, they have a family member uh, who can tell them about that. Uh, perhaps if they're older, they experienced them themselves uh, during World War II. Same thing in China. I mean, they've seen war. They've seen starvation. They've seen government purges. So they're not so anxious to pick a fight. But Americans really don't care, do they? Uh, Americans love war. It's entertainment for them. It's the mm -hmm. ultimate reality television. That's true. That's true. And, you know, in another future segment, perhaps we can talk about the entertainment liaison office within the CIA and the Department of Defense, which is an actual office for decades that works directly as a liaison with Hollywood. And this is where Hollywood studios get the equipment like the tanks, the helicopters, aircraft carriers, et cetera, access to military bases to then include in big blockbuster Hollywood movies as liberal Hollywood is literally a propaganda outlet for the Department of Defense yes. who has script approval in order to loan this equipment to the Hollywood studios uh, for uh, propaganda purposes. I have a uh, had firsthand experience with that. A friend of mine from high school, that was his job. Going out for the Department of Defense and, and looking at people's scripts, if they liked them, if they were friendly to the U.S. government, portrayed the military in a positive light, foreign policy in a positive light, they get green-lighted for massive amounts of equipment loaned to them, let them use it for free, that they could not afford in most cases to, uh, I mean, it was a huge amount of money. Even if they could afford it on their budget, they wouldn't want to uh, do it if they can get it for free. But you had to be a... Uh, uh, supporter of the American government's foreign policy, unquestioningly. If they didn't like what you were telling people, you didn't get the, the subsidy. I mean, I could name names. Phil Strub is the Department of Defense Entertainment Liaison mm -hmm. uh, Chief Officer, and he literally has script approval. He, he makes recommendations and changes to scripts before they sign off to loan this equipment, which often includes access to military bases for locations to shoot and even thousands or hundreds of uniformed servicemen and women who then are extras in yeah. these Hollywood movies. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, there was a this interesting story. Some people were putting together a documentary. I'd like to get an interview with them. Uh, is the writer with no hands is the name of it. Have you heard of that? Uh, is basically a guy who had done that sort of thing. He had scouted out locations with the CIA. He had told the government's story. He'd been a very successful writer. He decided he wanted to direct his own film. And he had a narrative that said that the uh, invasion of, um, uh, was it Nicaragua? Uh, not Nicaragua. What was Panama. Uh, Panama? Yes. Thank you. So you know about it. Yeah. Said that that was essentially an operation to recover uh, sex tapes that they were using to blackmail people in the Bush administration. And uh, he disappeared and they found him under some very mysterious circumstances. So that kind of stuff uh, happens and it comes back to bite a lot of the people who actually work with the uh, CIA and the uh, Defense Department. Yeah, you know, they're in the conspiracy community, there's a lot of people that, you know, are, are under the impression that any celebrity that dies is a sacrifice by the Illuminati and it's largely overblown. But there are serious cases like this, this scriptwriter who, mm -hmm. who was the screenwriter for Raw Deal, a popular Arnold Schwarzenegger film back in the 1980s in his early career. That's right. And he, his film was going to cover some very controversial aspects of U.S. invasion of Panama. And right after he, he completed his screenplay. He disappeared. They didn't find him for about a year or two years. He turned up dead with no hands. And his laptop, which had the screenplay on it, was never found. And yeah. so, you know, the, the, this the sort of thing happens if somebody in a powerful position is not going to play ball. Sometimes they start pulling these dirty tricks. And you know, as a media analyst myself, I have a bachelor's degree in communication. The author of seven, eight different books now. I focus on the power of the media, so many different issues to, to cover, but the media is such a powerful weapon. It's, it's a, a, a conditioning tool. It, entertainment is education for many people. And so you start uncovering these events of these screenwriters that have been murdered or coerced, the CIA working literally with Hollywood. I mean, this isn't a conspiracy theory by any means. The CIA.gov website has a section yeah. dedicated to the entertainment liaison office where they say that they welcome script writers and yes. producers to work with them. It's right there on their page. You're absolutely yes. right. Now, you know, we, of course, we have the uh, presidential election coming up in 2016. Uh, we've got 
a lot of uh, Republicans running. I think pretty much, uh, you know, I think probably getting close to 20 by now, or certainly they will by the time they start. Uh, and just uh, one, maybe two or three uh, Democrats. But maybe we need some more people on the Democrat side. You had a petition to endorse uh, Karl Marx for president in 2016. Tell us about that. Again, following in line with the anything for Obama theme, I just approached random beachgoers here in San Diego and told them that President Obama has endorsed Karl Marx, the author of the Communist Manifesto, <laughs> still considered to be one of the founding fathers of communism, who really was commissioned as a secretary by a secret society, which he admits in the manifesto itself, in the, one of the prefaces to the German edition, which I have, the very copy that I read in college. Uh, but I went and told these people that Obama has endorsed Karl Marx, his economic advisor, which, you know, is true. I mean, <laughs> Obama is a, is a communist, is a Marxist. And, but we still needed a hundred thousand signatures to, you know, to make that happen. Uh, I, that's a perfect fit, his economic advisor. Let's take a look at that petition. We're just gathering the, the signatures to get Karl Marx on the presidential ballot since Obama's been uh, working with him and applying his philosophy. We figure we'll get Karl Marx to become the next president on the 2016 right. ballot. So we're just gathering signatures showing people will support Karl Marx for president. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Obama has been following the uh, Karl Marx philosophies, and so we just want to gather signatures to show that the American public are are behind Obama and Karl Marx. So you're yeah. signed a petition to support Karl Marx philosophy. Thank you so much. Karl Marx? <laughs> yeah. We're just helping Obama continue the communist agenda. Uh, okay. All right. So just follow in Obama's footsteps and continue with the, the great work that he's been doing. So thank you for supporting Karl yeah, Marx for president. Okay. That's great. We're just yeah, let's come back. Uh, yeah, I guess at least maybe we could get him. Uh, Mark is uh, head of the Federal Reserve. I, you know, that, that fit. <laughs> you know, and, and I don't just I, you can see or you can hear if you watch the videos on YouTube.com slash Mark Dice. I mention the plan three times during every interaction it's not just hey will you support Karl Marx to to really pound it in mm -hmm. to show that these people just have no brain and that they really do approve these issues you can see I, t I tell them hey will you support Karl Marx and then as they continue to sign it I just keep repeating over and over yay thanks for supporting Karl Marx you're supporting Karl Marx you're supporting a nuclear attack on a Russia thank you for supporting the nuclear strike <laughs> and th this is how the Holocaust happened this is how yeah, yeah. you know that's true this Thousands of people followed orders that are completely inhumane and completely insane because there's something in the human psyche where they follow authority figures. And, you know, this is what the, the Milgram experiment decades ago illustrated when, mm -hmm. you know, people in a, a, a supposed doctors, they were all actors except for the, the test subjects, you know, were told to turn up the knob to shock people. And they were screaming and pretending to be in pain. And the doctor in the white lab coat, the authority figure, just kept telling them, no, it's OK. Just go. They're fine. Go ahead and keep on shocking them. And these these test subjects had no idea that this was just a, a big uh, experiment. And they, they repeated that on subjecting. They repeated that on uh, French television as well. You remember that? They went out and, and staged that on like a reality show for French television. And and they I mean, they really staged it. You know, you, they didn't just hear somebody screaming in the next room. They made it look like this person was dying and they were in front of a uh, television audience. And it was just like the Milgram experiment. When uh, our reporters were at uh, Bilderberg, uh, Rob Dew was talking to one of the uh, German police officers. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, you're you're. You're protecting the wrong people and keeping the wrong people away from them. He said, uh, we're just following orders. And this is in a country that has had a lot of instruction about what went wrong under Adolf Hitler. And yet to see a policeman saying that we just must follow orders and we always follow orders, we never think. And Rob is trying to get him to think outside the box, to think for himself, to, you know, to understand the moral implications of it. It's like, yeah, yeah, okay, but I got to follow orders. Still there. You're InfoWars Bilderberg coverage is incredible. And by the way, I mean, I, I think oh, you thanks. do a great job. You know, Alex Jones got some 
big, big shoes to fill over there, but I think you do a great job filling in for him, Dave. And it's incredible to see InfoWars over the last 10 years that I've been a part of the show to see your operation, Alex's operation, grow to this incredible force. And, and it gives us well, hope. I appreciate that. We've got some really good people here, and Alex is looking for more. If people heard that uh, announcement, they can see that on, on the website. Thank you so much. Uh, you, you interviewed some of these people, too, about Karl Marx, didn't you, Mark? Yeah. Now, we saw them. You heard them sign the petition to mm -hmm. agree with Karl Marx. But I wanted to get s uh, some insight into their thinking process, so I sort of did a follow-up. And I went and I just approached them and I told them with a handheld microphone, oh, President Obama's endorsed Karl Marx for his success or you think that's a good idea? Yeah, let's play that clip. Karl Marx has been an economic advisor to the Obama administration for many years. Obama's decided to elevate him to the level of presidency, full endorsement. <laughs> uh, should we continue with that policy to, to lead us to the road of prosperity and to the utopia we've all hoped for? I feel if we all desire to, we should. That uh, <laughs> if he decides to lead on and... Uh, Try to pick better decisions. I feel he would continue with the Marxist economic policies yeah. to lead us to the utopia that we've all really hoped for. Yeah, uh, Obama has chosen Karl Marx, the economic advisor. That's that he's amazing because they, they want be the they want their president. opinion put out there, don't they, Mark? So it's like, oh yes, yes, I, I agree with you totally. We're going to be right back with Mark Dice. Very interesting, very educational. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We've been talking to Mark Dice, and we've been looking at these. Various petition videos, of course, the central theme, as Mark has pointed out, is that people just want to do what authority figures tell them. And, of course, if he's there with a petition in his hand, he's kind of an authority figure, especially if he's got an Obama T-shirt on. They take him as an Obama supporter. There's a lot of just blind partisanship as well as a kind of tribalism that goes out. I want to play you that last uh, petition video, but before we do, uh, Mark's got a new book. Uh, the Bilderberg Group, Fact and Fiction. And, of course, we just had uh, the Bilderberg Conference uh, take place in Austria uh, about two weeks or so ago. Tell us about this uh, book, Mark. In years, and it's incredible to see, finally, thanks to social media, thanks to alternative media outlets like Infowars.com, we've smoked the Bilderberg Group out of their hole, somewhat getting some mainstream coverage but if you're new to this material, or even if you've been following it for years, if you want to put together some of the pieces of the puzzle to see the history of the Bilderberg Group, uh, I've uncovered their tax returns, their financial records, mm. uh, and track their history for the last 10 years. You can pick up the Bilderberg Group Facts and Fiction in paperback from Amazon.com or download any of my books inside the Illuminati, uh, the Illuminati Facts and Fiction onto your tablet or your e-reader. In writing, I'm a media analyst. Uh, writing is one of my favorite things to do, and I can't articulate this. It's so difficult to or verbally articulate a lot of this information. And so I've spent the last 10 years writing uh, seven different books on issues about the New World Order, the Illuminati, uh, these kinds of, you know, secret society type of issues. So exactly. if you're interested, you can pick up the book or check out my YouTube channel for more petition uh, videos and Man on the Street interviews. And that's very important because, you know, we've gone from a long period where, as you pointed out, uh, Bilderberg Group just didn't exist. And now they readily admit they can't avoid that anymore. They look stupid when they try to pretend that doesn't exist. So they just say, well, it's totally benign. It's just nobody's business. You know, it just happened to have this cordon of uh, 10 kilometers uh, around this hotel and an army of policemen to protect these guys who are, you know, heads of state and uh, industry and banks and military all meeting together. Just totally innocent. People need to understand that this is the core of these kind of secret agreements that are being rammed through right now with these trade treaties. And if we try to fight these things just on the basis of, well, it's going to be bad for jobs, we're tying both of our hands behind our back if we don't really understand where this is coming from. It's very important for people to understand that. And you can't tell me as a media analyst and as just a critical thinker that there hasn't been and continues to be a blackout in the American major mainstream media regarding the Bilderberg Group. And in the Bilderberg Group Facts and Fiction, I track the evolution of the cover-up and myself have personally called into the top-rated talk show hosts, Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, et cetera, over the last few years and asked them just simple, basic questions about the Bilderberg Group. 
And uh, <laughs> they, they hung up. They denied any knowledge. They ridiculed That was great. I saw that on Twitter. I saw the one that you did with Handy where you called him up and you asked him about the Bill of I have no idea what you're talking about. And because honey, he certainly knows what it's about. He certainly how has heard these, the word. How are these guys with their finger on the pulse of politics, with access to the top politicians and guests around the world, how are they not – informed about the Bilderberger. Well, obviously they are. Obviously yeah. they're part of this cover-up to prevent the American people and people around the world from learning about this history. So the Bilderberg Group, they have some explaining to do about their 60-year-long <laughs> cover-up. And you know, we have the documents from Hugh Gateskill, former Labor Party leader, in his estate showing that they planned the European Union under mass secrecy. It's mm -hmm. astounding when you really look at the evidence. And the EU currency as well, exactly. We don't have time to play any more of your videos. We're out of time, but they can go to markdice.com, I guess, and find the links to all of these petition videos. Or youtube.com slash markdice. YouTube.com slash markdice, okay, as well as markdice.com. Your new book, Bilderberg Group, Facts and Fictions. Thank you so much, Mark Dice. Join us 4 p.m. on Sunday, 4 p.m. Central.